shortly after I finished my undergraduate experience, I had a disconcerting realization. I'd moved to attend graduate school, and I was unpacking a box full of my notebooks from my undergrad. And as I took those notebooks out, I thought it would be fun to flip through them. So I started looking, and I saw my handwriting, and I saw a whole lot of content I didn't remember at all. I was shocked. I had studied hard, I'd gotten good grades at a rigorous university, and yet, I had forgotten so much, so little made it into my long-term memory. And this was shocking to me. What could I do better? What can we collectively do better to retain our learning? So the sad truth is that we've, we take a lot of content and cram it in our brains in a really short period of time. That leads to forgetting. We can do better. And two tools that I would like us to use more effectively are recall and reflection. And when we really embrace these, we can lead ourselves to lasting learning. So when you think about how to make learning happen, what comes to your mind? One common response is, well, I really learn something when I get the chance to teach it. And that's one thing I loved about graduate school. I finally got a formal chance to teach. But we all informally are teaching each other all the time. So why does teaching help us learn? Well, we have to recall information from our brains to transmit it to other people. And it's usually not just an isolated fact, but we have to put the pieces together and explain it coherently. And sometimes when we're trying to teach something, actually we come to a place where we're at a loss for words and we realize, actually, I didn't know that as well as I thought. But we can go back and we can fill in that gap in our knowledge and then we've deepened our learning. Interestingly, another strategy that works like this is testing. I know testing sounds scary, but it's an effective way to promote recall. So my recent story around testing, which happened about a month ago, involved me walking down the hallway and a former student came up to me and said, will you take my survey? And I said, oh, sure. And the first question on this survey was, what is coral? Is it an animal, a plant, or something else? And I stared at that piece of paper and I, Thought, and the only thing that would come to my mind was a mineral, calcium carbonate, which on some level, okay, it is a component of a coral reef, good, but actually that's not a living thing. Like that's not the answer to this question at all. So I failed my pop survey, but I went back, I looked it up, and it turns out the animal that's responsible for coral is a marine invertebrate. They're commonly called polyps, and associated with them are small unicellular organisms. We commonly just call them algae. They're dinoflagellates. They give coral its beautiful color. Okay, so maybe I didn't know then, but I was able to go back and fill in that gap of my knowledge and learn it better. So this is important. When we're constructing knowledge, we're putting pieces together, and it can help if we're building off of existing knowledge. For example, reading marine invertebrate doesn't do much for you unless you know invertebrates are a class of animals that don't have backbones, things like insects and lobsters and shrimp. But if you have that prior knowledge, you can build your framework, and that can be really helpful. So both teaching and testing give us opportunities for recall. I mentioned also reflection. And one time in my life where I really used reflection well was during my graduate school years, but it was actually not part of my graduate program. I was in a book group with a bunch of other women, and we met every couple of weeks, but we were a non-traditional book group in that we didn't cover a single book every session. We would spend a long time, and in fact, we spent a whole year on one communication book. Our sessions went like this. We would meet, and we'd make ourselves sit quietly for about five minutes. We'd get really present. And then we would read a portion of the book aloud, maybe about half an hour just reading aloud to each other. And then we would discuss, how did what we had just heard relate to what we had learned earlier? How had our practice learning, using what we had learned recently, how did that go for us? We reflected on what we were learning and we talked how we, about how we were putting it into practice together. And this was a really rich environment for learning for me. So, as a graduate student, I had a situation where a fellow graduate student took an expensive reagent out of the freezer and used it and hadn't given me a heads up. And so when I found out about this, I was really angry. I was annoyed. And I said, well, I've been learning about communication skills. How can I put this into practice? And so I sat down and I mapped out what happened objectively, what, 
were my needs in this situation and what was my request for moving forward? And then I shared that back with the fellow graduate student. And we moved forward with our relationship intact, no more missing reagents. And I had learned a new skill because in the past, I either would have gotten angry and made a counterproductive scene or more likely just said, okay, it's not really a big deal, I'll just forget about it. But really, it's more effective to be able to move forward in communication and keeping relationships strong. So through reflection, we can take skills, integrate them, and then actually effectively apply them in our lives. As I've become an educator, I've been thinking, how can I bring recall and reflection into the classroom? How can we do this together? And after my first year here at Metropolitan State University of Denver, I went to a conference where I was learning about this really exciting technique to try to bring these skills into the classroom. And it was a worksheet-based technique. And I realized, after I came back, all excited to try it, that either I was going to have to have my students buy yet another resource, pay money for something that I was only going to use a small portion of with them, or I was going to have to create resources for my class from scratch, which I did, but wouldn't it have been awesome to be able to take existing resources and iterate them, build on them, because my coworkers and I share resources all the time. Oh, sure, take my slides, change them as you like. This is a very functional way to teach. And it turns out other people have realized the need for this too, and they've created something called Creative Commons licensing. So instead of putting something out there with a regular C and saying all rights reserved, when you create a work, you can put it out there with a Creative Commons license, and this allows free reuse. And in many cases, depending on the license, free remixing for future users of this. This has been transformational for educational materials. There's been an explosion of open educational materials. So OER for open educational materials. They're licensed so that they can be freely reused and remixed. So this is powerful because as we know, students are paying a lot for materials. This institution and many others estimate that students should be saving or expecting to spend $1,400 a year on textbooks which is a huge amount of money. With these open educational resources, students can have access to online copies and then print on demand as needed. So these resources include textbooks, traditional things that look like resources we're familiar with, and also new exciting things like online simulations. Khan Academy counts as an example of OER. So these Open licenses have allowed us to create a wealth of educational materials. So thanks to the hard work of authors, thanks to funding by major philanthropic organizations and small donors, there already exists a huge number of resources that we can use in an educational context. So I'm excited about these and I'm promoting their use. But how does this relate to my emphasis on recall and reflection? Can these new resources that are openly licensed actually enhance the learning process? And the answer is yes. So not only are faculty free to modify them as needed to make them fit their class well, but students are free to modify them as they're studying with them. And even better, students have access to them for the long haul. So often, if a student buys a textbook, they need to sell it back. Or nowadays, students are renting textbooks. Or students are getting digital access for 180 days. But as we saw with my notebooks, learning doesn't happen neatly in one semester. And if we really want to learn something, we're going to have to go back and revisit it again and again. And this is a strength of open educational resources. So I would like to share a story that illustrates how we sometimes get stuck on specific strategies and we do well to dig deeper. So my daughter, I took her to the sandbox, she eyed a purple shovel and she got excited and was moving towards it and then another kid picked it up and started playing with it. And she had a meltdown. <laughs> and how often are we like that child, right? We know as adults, if she had just looked deeper and thought, oh, hey, I'm here to have fun at the playground and I can play with a different sand toy or I can go play on the swings, everything would have been okay, right? So when we're students, when we're in that student space, what do we often do? We just try to cram knowledge into our head in a really short term and we fail to realize that really we want to know this for the long haul. We want lasting learning. And if we could just space out our recall practice, we might spend the same total number of hours, but if we spread it out over more time, we're going to integrate this information more fully into our brains, make it more available to us in the future. As faculty, what's our metaphorical purple shovel? Where do we get stuck? 
So often we get stuck on, I've always taught this way, or I just use this one textbook. But the game has changed. There's a whole range of resources that are available to us. We should at least consider, are there other ways we can meet our learning goals for our students? And then finally, those of us who are OER advocates, what is our deeper goal? We want to make education accessible to people all over the world. We want to lower entry barriers. We want to make information available to people so it can impact their lives in a positive way. And to do that most fully, we need to help people understand how to interact with that information so that the learning can be deep and meaningful. So what about you? You're here. We're watching TED Talks. You may be seeing many TED Talks today. What can you do when you hear an idea that really grabs you to help make it part of your life? Well, you can practice recall. Later today, you can jot down some notes. What do you remember from that talk that you're wanting to keep with you? You can share it with a friend. And then after you sleep tonight, practice recall again. It feels a little effortful. It feels a little hard, but that's where the learning happens. You can go back and watch it again, fill in the gaps. It will become more meaningful. And then reflect, why is this of interest to you? What are the next steps that you could take? Maybe you even want to look for some open educational resources associated with the topic. You can check out the open textbook library. You can use library guides created by librarians to search for OER. Or you can find other resources that help you go deeper with that which is interesting to you. So you get to decide where are you putting your energy. But ultimately, when we use recall and reflection, we're increasing our agency. We're able to build additional skills. We're able to build our network of knowledge. And ultimately, we're able to live the lives we're longing to lead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.